Welcome everyone to our first QA forum of 2023. I'm Dr. Michael Novick, the Director of Education and Associate Director of Quality Assurance for VRAD. Today we'll be reviewing some musculoskeletal cases. Before we get started, here is our accreditation statement and the learning objectives for this lecture. Our first patient is a 12-year-old boy with right knee pain. Here is the AP radiograph of the right knee. And the corresponding lateral view. An MRI of the knee was subsequently obtained. Here are the coronal T1 weighted images. the coronal fluid sensitive sequence, and finally the sagittal fluid sensitive images. Let's return to the radiographs to review the findings. There is cortical irregularity along the lateral weight-bearing surface of the lateral femoral condyle. The lateral view helps us more accurately characterize the location of the finding. To the posterior lateral weight-bearing surface of the lateral femoral condyle, The same finding is clearly evident on this coronal T1 weighted image from the MRI. Here it is again along the posterior lateral weight bearing surface of the lateral femoral condyle on this sagittal fluid sensitive image. Important to note in this case that the overlying articular cartilage is grossly preserved. Our diagnosis in this case is osteochondritis desiccans. There's always a fair bit of uncertainty regarding what to call each of the various types of osteochondral defect, which is the umbrella term for these lesions. And that term covers osteochondral fractures, subchondral insufficiency fractures, avascular necrosis, our friend osteochondritis desiccans, as well as osteoarthrosis. Frankly, what you call the lesion is much less important than staging it. I won't get into the details of that during this lecture, but if you see fluid undercutting the fragment, adjacent cystic change, abnormality of the overlying articular cartilage, those are some of the indications of lesion instability, which can necessitate surgical intervention. In our case, the overlying articular cartilage was normal, indicating a lower grade stable lesion for which conservative therapy is generally the first line treatment. This journal article offers an excellent review of the different types of osteochondral lesions and some of the ways you can differentiate them from one another. Our next patient is a 10-year-old girl status post fall. Only one image for this case. This is an AP radiograph of the pelvis. There is a subtle curvilinear opacity abutting the left anterior superior iliac spine, which is consistent with an avulsion fracture. Here's a similar case. This is a 15-year-old boy with left hip pain. Again, we have a single AP radiograph of the pelvis. 
And once again, we have a curvilinear opacity adjacent to the left anterior superior iliac spine. In this case, it's much more conspicuous. Consistent with another anterior superior iliac spine avulsion fracture. It's never a bad time to review the common pediatric pelvic avulsion fracture sites. As we just saw, the anterior superior iliac spine, which is the sartorius origin, the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is the rectus femoris origin, the greater femoral trochanter, where the gluteus medius and minimus tendons insert, the lesser femoral trochanter, where the iliopsoas tendon inserts, and finally the ischial tuberosity, where the hamstring tendons originate. So make sure that you're familiar with all these sites for pediatric radiographs of the pelvis. With adults, we're going to be looking more at the femoral necks, the superior and inferior pubic rami, and the sacral alley. But for kids, these are the most common sites for traumatic injury. With that last image fresh in our minds, let's move on to the next case. This is a 12-year-old girl with right hip pain. Here is our AP radiograph of the pelvis. Make sure you scrutinize all those areas we just reviewed. A coned down view of the right hip was obtained. Here is that image. This child moved on to the MRI scanner as the plane radiographs were for all intents and purposes negative. These are the axial fluid sensitive images from that examination. Here are the coronal fluid sensitive images from that study. Let's review our findings. There is a partial thickness avulsion injury at the level of the right anterior inferior iliac spine, corresponding to the rectus femoris tendon origin. There is adjacent soft tissue swelling and edema, which is often the most conspicuous finding, particularly in cases like this one where there is no displaced osseous fragment. On this coronal image, we can clearly see the partial thickness tendon tear and the adjacent fluid and soft tissue swelling. So this is a rectus femoris avulsion injury at the level of the anterior inferior iliac spine. Our next patient is a 57-year-old woman status post blunt trauma. These are axial images from a non-contrast CT scan of the left hip. You'll notice the patient has undergone a left hip arthroplasty. Here are the coronal images from the same study.
Let's review the findings first on the axial images. There is an acute, mildly displaced segmental fracture of the left inferior pubic ramus. There is also a non-displaced fracture of the superior pubic ramus. And on this coronal image, a buckled fracture of the sacral ala is evident. Isolated pelvic bone fractures are somewhat uncommon, so you should always look for a second and even a third fracture if you see one. As we all know, it's very common to see superior and inferior pubic rami fractures, but in many cases there are also fractures of the sacral ala, so it's important to include that region in your search pattern. Our last patient is a 38-year-old man, status post-electrocution and fall from a ladder. He's having a terrible day. We begin, as we so often do, with a single plane radiograph. followed by an MRI. These are coronal fluid sensitive images. Here is the sagittal fluid sensitive sequence. Returning to our plane radiograph to review the findings. There is mild widening of the acromioclavicular articulation. With elevation of the distal clavicle relative to the acromion. And resultant widening of the coracoclavicular interval. The sagittal fluid sensitive images from the MRI are excellent for evaluating the supporting ligaments of the shoulder. And here we can see the widening of the acromioclavicular joint space that was evident on the plane radiographs is due to underlying rupture of the acromioclavicular ligaments. And similarly, the widening of the coracoclavicular interval is due to rupture of the underlying coracoclavicular ligament. This constellation of findings is consistent with a type 3 acromioclavicular joint separation. Let's talk very briefly about acromioclavicular joint injuries. These injuries are typically graded according to the Rockwood classification system. With type 1 injuries, there is no clavicular elevation. With type 2 injuries, the clavicle is elevated, but the lower border of the clavicle is not elevated above the upper border of the acromion. With type 3 injuries, the lower border of the clavicle is elevated above the upper border of the acromion. However, the coracoclavicular interval is not more than two times normal, which is generally considered approximately 1.1 to 1.3 centimeters. Type 4 injuries involve posterior displacement of the distal clavicle. Type 5 injuries involve more significant superior displacement of the distal clavicle with greater than two times the normal coracoclavicular interval. And finally, type 6 injuries which involve inferior displacement of the distal clavicle. This radiographics article gives a great overview of the various acromioclavicular joint separation injuries. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you next time for part two.